is recording. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone for joining our uh, talk. And uh, as uh, so Peng Chen uh, so just mentioned, this is also going to be our last talk. And then uh, so this is officially uh, so after today, and then our summer talk series will end. And also thank you for attending the talk since it's already uh, so uh, 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 so already Friday afternoon. Um, so our today uh, speaker is Dr. Uh, Xin Lei Chen. Uh, he's a research scientist at Facebook AI Research. Uh, so Xin Lei is a uh, well-established researcher in computer vision. Uh, he has uh, obtained his PhD uh, from CMU, and then before that, he obtained his bachelor degree from Zhejiang University, China. Uh, he has a lot of interesting work. Uh, so he has been working on vision language pre-training and recently focused on self um, uh, supervised learning. And he's the creator and the main contributor of MoCo V2 and the MoCo 3. And due to his work in self supervised learning, he also received uh, so two big uh, so two big awards uh, just this year. So which is uh, CVPR 2021 Best Paper Honorable Mention and also ICML 2021 outstanding paper. Uh, so without further delay, I'm going to hand over to Xin Lei and then yeah, so Xin Lei, you can go ahead. OK, OK. Thanks so much for the uh, invite and uh, for the introduction. Um, I think I cannot see you guys, so uh, if you uh, have questions, uh, please feel free to speak up. Uh, we have quite a few things to cover today. Uh, as you can see from the title, it's three uh, explorations. Um, pre-training. So uh, yeah, um, let's let's get started. So pre-training is a very important topic, uh, both in uh, vision and language separately. Uh, so in vision, people have uh, uh, used uh, ImageNet as a pre-training uh, data set and then transfer the learned representation to other tasks. And this is not just for single image, but also for 3D and so for video. Um, and for language, uh, you guys probably know that there's a, a big revolution of uh, pre-training uh, just using uh, language data. Uh, uh, for example, Google's BERT uh, series and uh, OpenAI's GPT series. And to be uh, more aligned to today's theme, uh, I think uh, I borrowed this slide from Jira, I think is a uh, uh, vision and language and recently there are a lot of oh uh, uh, yes. so are you moving your slides because i'm uh, seeing the slides is the same uh the first page oh okay can you see the slide now yeah so we can see the slide but uh uh, uh so just now i didn't see the slide is moving down uh, okay it's still on your first page oh, oh. yeah okay let me let me switch to full screen share. Then. Uh, is it better? I mean, can you see the? Uh, yes. My my screen is too wide, so I'm afraid people will only see a, a small portion of it. Uh, is it the entire yeah. screen or it's uh, uh, just the size? So it's uh, the entire screen, yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, it's very long. Oh, okay. no, no, it's good. Yeah, oh, it's no, good. It OK. Yeah, so I just said there, pre-training is very important for both vision and language. And for vision plus language, there are also a lot of works on uh, pre-training. Uh, in particular, joint pre-training of uh, vision and language on uh, Paired imaging text data. This is just stealing from Jersey slide, I think. Uh, and for this talk, I'm going to talk about three things uh, of pre training. Uh, the first is uh, our analysis on visual features uh, pre trained for vision and language tasks. And this is just covering the visual feature part. Um, the second one is the approach. Uh, we recently presented at the CVPR this year. Uh, we call it SimCM uh, for self-supervised visual representation learning. 
And the third one is uh, to be published at ICCD this year, uh, where we explored uh, a different architecture, uh, vision transformers for uh, self-supervised learning, and in particular, uh, learning with uh, CMS networks. So the first one is uh, analysis. Um, it's a work done by uh, our intern, Huai Zhu, uh, during his internship. Um, for all the works I covered, uh, we have released the code and you can find uh, the, the technical reports online. Um, so at a high level, vision and language pipelines uh, are something like this. Uh, we first get a visual representation uh, from uh, visual data. We get a textual representation from language data. And then uh, we do multimodal fusion uh, for these two domains. And probably you can tell because we are doing vision plus language research, the most important and active uh, part is the fusion part. But uh, in our study, we actually find the visual representation, the V part, is uh, also play, playing a very crucial role for the final performance. So this visual representation is uh, dominated by uh, an approach developed by MSR people uh, in uh, 2017. It's called bottom-up attention. Um, and the idea is to represent images with regions. Um, so here is an example. You are probably familiar with it. Uh, the main idea is to use uh, multiple spatially localized features uh, in bounding boxes uh, to represent an image. Uh, it's called bottom up because uh, the regions are picked without top down prior uh, from text. It's just telling which regions are more salient in the image and select that. And the in terms of a detailed implementation, uh, the bottom up attention uh, executes like this. So it will first pre-train a fast RCN detector on a data set called the visual genome and with the tasks object detection and attribute classification. Um, and it uses a backbone uh, ResNet. And then given an image, uh, it will do two things. The first is to do region selection. Uh, so it will score each region and then uh, select the, the top ones. And the second stage is given the selected uh, regions, it will compute the average pooled features uh, uh, per region with, uh, with some operations called ROI pool. Um, and since its proposal, it has uh, dominated leaderboards uh, and it's even used today uh, as a very popular representation uh, for vision language. Um, and the success has a reason because uh, intuitively uh, it has uh, many advantages over grid features. Uh, so for example, it can localize individual objects better. Uh, it can capture uh, both the colors and the fine details, and it can model object interactions maybe more explicitly uh, with multiple boxes. But um, the proposed approach actually have uh, several differences uh, when compared to prior work. Um, so, for example, the pre-training task is different. Uh, one is image net classification, uh, but for bottom-up attention, it's detection. It's also using a different data set. Uh, one is image net, the other is uh, visual genome. Uh, and there are many other factors. So in this work, we conducted uh, a controlled analysis or study to understand uh, what are the important factors uh, that uh, influence the final performance. So here is our basic setup. Uh, we have we have to fix a lot of things. Uh, for example, the pre-training task. Uh, so making sure both grid features and uh, region features are uh, uh, using the same pre-training uh, data set and uh, objective function. 
Uh, the other is a backbone, uh, ResNet 50, and we fix the input size. Um, and we use uh, BQA and BQA score as our uh, guidance uh, for, for analysis. And uh, we just pick one of the best models back then called Pythia uh, to, uh, to do the uh, BQA task. Um, so the first study we have in this work is uh, just get grid features from the same layer. Um, so you can see from the left side, it's the original fast RCN detector. Uh, it has a region selection stage, and then it does region feature computation. And then uh, after it get uh, all the features, it will um, align, uh, will arrange it in a, in an array, like n regions. Um, but then we can simplify with grid features, we can just take the, the, the same pre-trained ResNet, and then we directly compute using all the weights uh, to get a spatially arranged uh, edge by W grids. Uh, and in fact, it can work pretty well. So in this case, we have a, a regions, uh, uh, region and grids is the only difference uh, in our setting. So we fix the pre-training task, we have fixed the data set, and we find the, the gap in terms of VQA score is much smaller uh, if we use the grids and compare it with regions pre-trained uh, VG detection. Uh, so 60.8 compared to 63.6. Uh, um, so in the second study, um, next we want to improve uh, uh, the pre-training state, uh, pre-training uh, strategy for grids because this object detection pipeline have been highly optimized uh, for uh, regions. For example, RCN, the R actually means uh, regions. Um, so our modification uh, is actually very simple. Um, we just want to break the spatial representation of regions in the RCN pipeline. So previously, it will have a, a 14 by 14 hour pooling. Uh, in our case, to break the spatial representation, we just make it one by one. So each our put feature is one by one, and and uh, and uh, we moved the the weights around in order to have a, a fair amount of uh, of, of parameters. Uh, but overall, it's the most crucial thing is uh, to have 14, four, 14 by fourteen our pooling to one by one. Um, and after this change, uh, we still do uh, grid feature extraction uh, using the, the same bottleneck, uh, get the edge by W grids. And we find uh, it has the interesting effect that it improves the grid features uh, from 63.6 to 64.4, so almost on par with the regions but it actually hurts the region features uh, almost to the level of grid features. Um, so with these two studies, uh, we have a, a conclusion that grid features can work uh, just as well as regions for VQA. Um, and to make the study even more rigorous, uh, we want to compare the number of visual features used uh, between regions and grids. Because usually N regions are uh, sparsely sampled and uh, grid features, because we use all the edge by W grids, uh, usually it has a, a, a bigger number uh, in terms of uh, visual features. So we tried to gradually increase the number of regions uh, to represent uh, the image, and uh, uh, here we plot the curve on the right side. So initially, or, or the default setting is usually something around 100, uh, 100 region features, and we gradually increase the number of regions sampled because we can uh, 
look down uh, at the at the ranked list, uh, and we increased uh, to the same number of features. So uh, six hundred, which is equal to roughly equal to h by w, uh, and we find that they are still roughly on par. So the increase, the improvement from one hundred to six hundred, uh, is not. Uh, I mean, the number of features is not the cause that uh, regions and the features are, are similar. Um, and here are some visualizations uh, in terms of attention. Uh, so regions uh, are usually uh, boxes uh, covered in different uh, locations of the image. And for grids, uh, uh, you can tell it's uh, usually some dots uh, for uh, for this. So these are showing that grid features are, are paying the right amount of attention uh, to salient uh, objects. For, for example, the free frisbee here. Um, for more visualizations, uh, we find grid features actually have an advantage. So uh, on this. Uh, upper right side for the bus uh, because the region features uh, it will detect the bus detect the person but it's very hard for it to detect the, the number region over there so it will uh, cover a big area um, but the box of, uh, of the actual bus number is is missing but in our case uh, the attention is uh, is highly focused on the uh, the area that the bus number can occur. Um, so that's an interesting uh, observation we find, although both of the models get the answer wrong. Um, and then we did uh, more studies uh, to see whether grids uh, similar to regions holds across uh, which scenarios. We tried the different backbones, we tried different VQA models, uh, VQA tasks, and other tasks, and we find uh, all of them, it, the, the conclusion holds. And for the fourth study, uh, we find that uh, our grid features can work is not only because uh, we pre-train on the same task, it's also very related to the input image size or the resolution, because the default classification pipeline feeds a lower resolution. This lower resolution can uh, actually misses maybe some small objects. So the VQA score is uh, uh, relatively low. And when it is uh, uh, using the same uh, resolution as the region features, um, the, the, the VQA scores gets, gets improved. And in fact, we can get even better results by further increasing the um, input image size. So that's another factor. And finally, we studied about attributes. Uh, this is just a side analysis, and we find uh, Actually, attributes. Actually, may I ask you a question? Yes. Could you go to the previous slides? Uh, sure. And here, I still don't get why those great feature works. What's What's the reason? Uh, so there are two reasons. So one is uh, the pre-training task. Uh, so previously, the grid features were usually pre-trained on ImageNet classification. Um, so in this case, the grid of our grid features are pre-trained on object detection and attribute uh, classification. So that's one important reason. So the other reason. May I ask why this pre-trained task is pretty important? So is this affect a, a the feature distribution over the image? Mm. So like in the image pre -net, image net pre-chain, only the most discriminative part is uh, is enabled and the other part not well learned. And like in your object detection, every grid gets more chance to learn and such such things is important for the VQA task, or oh, what's, is this one of yeah, the reasons? I, yeah, I think uh, this is uh, very important. Uh, another important thing which we find amusing is that, uh, I mean, the distribution of a VG 
uh, is closer to the cocoa images. Uh, and in fact, some of the VG question answer pairs are uh, built on uh, cocoa images. So there's the overlap. Uh, so in some sense, this VG pre-training with object detection task is, uh, is kind of cheating because for some of the images, uh, it has already seen during the object detection pre-training stage. Uh, so that's why maybe, I mean, the distribution is, is dangerously close to uh, the VQA task uh, compared to ImageNet. Got it. Th thank you. Yeah. Uh, in um, fact, I also want to add something here. So mm. first thing is that I, I think uh, uh, I agree with the domain gap is smaller for VG because they both use cocoa images. But I think for the pre-training, it's uh, dangerous that people already deal with this one because kind of when we pre-train with VG, we carefully mm -hmm. select, kind of rule out the validation and the uh, kind of test images for uh, no matter kind of cocoa caption or uh, VQA test uh, or validation images. So I think the danger is uh, kind of, the danger is okay. Okay. But, okay. Uh, in fact, I, I have one question. One, so why is the kind of VG uh, is domain gap is same kind of more close to VQA compared with ImageNet? The other thing is that for this grid feature, it it is trained in a localized way, but for mm -hmm. ImageNet uh, pre-training, it's kind of uh, the kind of the model only finally get a global feature and then do a classification. Mm -hmm. Have you ever tried to see that, okay, whether kind of how much the recovery or the domain gap contributes to, and how much this kind of localized pre-training kind of contributes mm -hmm. to? Mm. I think we, hmm. I don't think we have done specific experiments, for example, on ImageNet object detection uh, to, to, to study this, uh, but one thing we have tried is uh, for for object detection, uh, the pre-training task is uh, is not necessarily need to be object detection. It can be just localized uh, region classification on visual genome. Uh, so if we just do region classification by cropping those ground truth box uh, and then do classification on top of that. Uh, we see similar performance to uh, object detection pre-training, uh, as long as it does both object classification and uh, uh, attribute classification. Um, yeah, but otherwise we haven't studied, uh, like because we don't have a global label for VG images yeah. and for ImageNet, uh, we, we haven't tried uh, using localized bounding boxes. Yeah, that's a good point. But I, I just realized that that will be an interesting experiment. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe I will try something like use VG just for image tagging pre-training. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, yeah, I think we have a lot of to cover, so uh, I'll move fast. Um, so there are two benefits of grid features. The first one is simplifying the pipeline. Um, so, you know, um, Bottom-up attention uses uh, region selection and region feature computation, and it's taking a lot of time uh, to to do that. For grid features, it just uses the bottom uh, the uh, the backbone, so uh, it's it's much faster. Uh, so usually it leads to uh, ten to uh, an order of a magnitude faster in terms of a speed. Um, and another thing is uh, with grid features, we can do some early fusion models between vision and language. Uh, it's covered in our uh, another work. Uh, and uh, both of these work lead us to uh, winning a challenge last year uh, in VQA uh, with our improved uh, uh, work. Um, and this is not the, um, the happiest thing, uh, actually, the happiest thing for us is uh, we find even in this year's winner, uh, they use uh, both the region feature and the grid feature uh, to 
uh, to win the task and significantly outperformed uh, our last year's number. Uh, so it's a sign that the grid features are indeed helpful, uh, uh, validated by others. Um, I think I just move on to the second part. It's moving away from uh, uh, vision and the language, so uh, a little bit different from uh, uh, the theme of this uh, series, but uh, we want to uh, focus on pre-training on, on the vision uh, side only. Um, this is work uh, we call the SimSam uh, for representation learning, and this is work with Kami. And there are many exciting uh, frameworks in this uh, space. Uh, uh, it's called self-supervised learning or unsupervised uh, learning. Uh, for example, MoCo uh, and the follow-up works have uh, closed uh, the gap between a linear feature uh, just placed on top of a pre-trained uh, model versus end-to-end -end, end -end, uh, trained ImageNet uh, uh, 1K classification. So this figure is from last year. Uh, MoCo is, uh, no, last last year. It's uh, 60 uh, in terms of accuracy, uh, and ImageNet supervised is around 76. Uh, but this year, uh, with a series of, uh, last year, with a series of work of SimClear, uh, Bio, and Swolf, uh, people have largely closed the gap. So, for example, Swav is already reaching 75% uh, compared to 76% of supervised. Uh, this is a very uh, big progress uh, because uh, in terms of linear classification, uh, there's only one layer that can be trained and the entire backbone uh, is fixed. Um, um, and there are quite a few common themes about uh, these frameworks uh, and one common theme is called Siamis or dual network. Uh, this is a very natural option because in supervised learning we have uh, ground truth labels so you, you can just take an image and then map to a prediction and this prediction can be directly compared with the ground truth with some similarity uh, metric but in unsupervised or self-supervised self -supervised learning we do not have such um, advantage. So an easy way to, to do is we, we run the encoder twice. So once on one view of the image, the other on uh, the second view of the image. Um, and because they are from the same image, their encoding results uh, should be similar to each other. So this becomes a natural uh, objective. Uh, and because this is a weight sharing network, it's called a CMS network. Um, but directly using this CMS network uh, does not work that well. Um, actually, it collapses uh, to trivial solutions because it can just predict a constant number uh, for everything. Uh, so no matter what I give, it's just uh, outputting the same uh, value again and again uh, for all the images. So in this way, the similarity loss is satisfied but the representation is not meaningful at all. <clears throat> and in the literature, there are many countering strategies uh, for, for this. Um, so one representative one is contrastive learning. Uh, so it explicitly requires uh, dissimilarity for views from different images. So predicting constant is no longer uh, an optimal solution. Um, and a popular loss function is called info NCE loss, uh, and at the high level, it's just uh, making the positive pairs similar while making the negative pairs dissimilar. But one drawback of info NCE loss is that it usually requires a sufficiently large amount of negatives for good performance. Um, and previous frameworks uh, like SimClear will have to use a, a large batch size to provide uh, <coughs> negative pairs. And this requires, uh, for example, more than eight, uh, far more than eight GPUs. And MoCo did it in a, in a more smart way uh, by storing negatives in a, in a momentum queue. 
and it decouples the batch size from negative set size uh, with some additional memory overhead. Um, and there are other strategies uh, in the in the in the literature. So one is called a balanced online clustering swap. Um, and the key idea is to make sure that the cluster sizes uh, being assigned to are balanced. Um, so this can avoid trivial solution because uh, if it is a trivial solution, everything predicts to the same vector, then this vector will be assigned to the same cluster center, and then that cluster size will be uh, huge, uh, taking all the all the data points, while other cluster centers will be empty. So enforcing a balanced uh, cluster size helps. And then there's this uh, interesting work bio last year from uh, DeepMind. It introduces additional uh, predictor and still use the momentum encoder uh, to uh, encode the, uh, the, the target representation. Uh, for those of you who do not know momentum encoder, it's just a moving average of uh, the base encoder weights. So uh, just keeping a moving average, another copy of the of the encoder weights. Um, and this automatically uh, stops the weights from being updated by gradients because it's updated by uh, moving average of, uh, of base uh, weights. But we need to maintain two copies of weights in this way. Um, so all these things are uh, uh, very interesting, but in this work, we want to see whether a simple CMS network can just work without uh, such things. Um, so in this work, we proposed something called SimCM, uh, and it's indeed very similar, uh, very simple. We have two encoders. Uh, actually, these two encoders share weights, so we don't need to maintain two copies of weight. Uh, we add a predictor on the encoder, and this predictor is used to predict the output of uh, of uh, the, the second encoder. Uh, oh, oh, okay, the encoder of the second view. And we apply a stop gradient operation uh, on, the, on the right side, uh, and we will show this is very important uh, for this data. And uh, the pseudo code for SimCM is a little bit more, adding a little bit more things. Uh, the first one is it's a symmetric uh, loss. So the encoder is uh, applied to two views. So uh, and the predictor is applied twice. Um, and it will uh, uh, compute the loss once have uh, X1 as a source x2 as a target, the other x2 as a source, and x1 as a target. Um, and then we have a L2 normalized uh, uh, input, uh, L2 normalized output by default. This is uh, uh, following the common practice. Um, yeah. And at the high level, SimCM uh, simplifies those frameworks because it can be viewed as uh, sim clear without the negatives, uh, swap without online clustering, bio without momentum encoder, and compared to MoCo, it removes uh, both contrastive learning and uh, uh, momentum encoder. So it's no longer neither more or co. Um, so next, we describe our uh, settings for experiments um, to, to, to check the behavior of SimCM. We use ResNet 50 with a projector. Uh, we use a sync batch norm, and we add this predictor from bio. But an important thing we find is to have a bottleneck architecture for predictor. So the hidden dimension is uh, uh, smaller than the input and output. And for pre-training, uh, we use uh, SGD uh, plus momentum uh, optimizer. Uh, we do, do not use large batch optimizers. And we evaluate in this linear evaluation protocol that freezes uh, the, the, the entire uh, backbone, but we only uh, train the, the, 
the linear layer on top of it. Um, so the first study uh, we we see is for SIMSIA, a stop gradient is uh, uh, is crucial. So without it, the representation collapses. Um, and this is actually implicit behavior for momentum encoder because momentum encoder copies weights from the other and do not get gradients. Um, yeah, with stop gradient, it's uh, 67. Without it's 0 0.1, that's a chance level classification for a thousand uh, class classification. And this is reflected in uh, multiple monitors we have. Uh, so both in terms of loss, it collapses to uh, the, the minimum, uh, the, the statistics of the representation and the k nearest neighbor monitor we placed. Hi, Shin, may I ask you yes. a question in the yes. previous slides? Yes. Is this one? So, OK. Even though uh, without the stop gradient, it's considered as the collapsing. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's the global minimum. If you only consider the uh, positive examples, right? Yes, yes, yes. So basically, your job is trying to find a, a local minimum rather yes. than a global minimum. Yes, 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 exactly, exactly. So uh, could you share some properties, you know, what that local minimum should have, which is the stop gradient is good for localize that local minimum rather than the global minimum? Um, I think one property, uh, I think it's mentioned in literature, is uh, the features should be scattered uh, in the space. Uh, so that's why we have this first monitor uh, to uh, monitor uh, whether the features are having a good standard deviation. So without a standard, with a standard deviation to be zero, it means everything is predicting the same. So that's a, a property to have. Uh, and yeah, I think of I think for others. Uh, yeah, we do not, we do not have a, a, I mean, very clear uh, other than this, a very clear signal other than this, uh, that the features for different images should be scattered uh, in, in the space. So can we understand the scattered thing? Uh, let's say, uh, let's assume the, uh, the the space, the feature space is uh, on, a, on a sphere, on a unit sphere. Mm -hmm. And all of the features on, on the sphere. Mm -hmm. But if you do not do the stop gradient, and the two features are considered positive, they will not go to each other. They will go to the center of the sphere together. Then it crashed. Mm. Because you know, if they can go to each other along the uh, along the sphere, uh, on the sphere yeah. face. They can also go to the center of the sphere. That's the uh, uh, crashing point. But that's the local. That's the global minimum. Well, so, I think I think that because we do L two normalization in in our algorithm, so all the output is L two normalized. So it will make sure the output representation is always on the sphere. It will never go into the, the center of a, like the origin point. Um, okay. So, so if that's the case, in the, in the crashing case, mm -hmm. that means all of the points go to one point on the yes, sphere. Yes, go to a one point on the sphere, yes. So basically, the more scatter over the sphere, the more likely you will go to a local minimum, which is the good one, rather than go to the one point, which is the global minimum. Yeah, I think you can understand it in, in that way. OK, thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, I think we have a lot of things to cover, but um, the last, the, the, pro the most, the, the last property we want to cover is uh, the predictor is important. So we also did trying uh, different setups for the predictor. So without a predictor, we find it also collapses, but it actually is effectively the same as stop gradient. 
uh, uh, without a stop gradient. Uh, because we apply a symmetrized loss, uh, so it will back propagate gradients twice, once on the left side, once on the right side. Uh, yeah, it may require more thinking, but it's equivalent. Um, but in later experiment, we find the predictor is not crucial. Uh, it can be removed without collapsing. Um, so let me skip this. Uh, let me see. Yeah, so this is a important slide for our understanding of stop gradient. Uh, as uh, as Joe mentioned, it's just uh, providing a different trajectory uh, that tries to find the local minima instead of the uh, global minima. And uh, with this trajectory, we have two sets of parameters, uh, and it's trying to alternate between these two sets of parameters for um, for finding the local minimum. Mm, I'll skip this uh, objective function and uh, other things, but um, we show that SimCM is actually one step alternation. So it will update the network with one step of gradient descent, uh, and the other step is trying to uh, update the hidden representation of uh, each image. Um, and we did some uh, proof of concept ex experiments to, to show uh, it's indeed true. So we did uh, multi-step alternation. So we will apply the SGD optimizer multiple times before we update, uh, update the other uh, set of parameters. Um, and we find it, it also works, and in fact, it works better than uh, our SimCM uh, original setup because it has a momentum encoder effect. Um, yeah, let me skip this. And then we did our final uh, comparison with uh, different uh, epochs of training, and we, sh we find that SimCM uh, can be comp competitive uh, with a batch size friendly uh, uh, method uh, and without momentum encoder. We transferred these results for other tasks like object detection, and we find in general all these methods work well uh, for object detection. It outperforms supervised ImageNet pre training. Uh, but uh, yeah, SimCM is also uh, competitive. Um, and then this is an important uh, message we want to deliver is that sim simple CMS network uh, may be the bare minimum uh, that uh, that can be used to learn uh, invariance because invariance by definition it means two views of the same concept should produce the same output so that's almost the definition of a CMS network. Um, and for some simple CM invariants like um, translation, um, it can be baked into convolutions as inductive biases. But more complex transformations, for example, uh, color augmentations or scale changes or rotation of the object, uh, these are very hard to bake into the architecture design. So in such case, CMS network can at least serve as a strong baseline, and it's a data-driven baseline uh, to learn invariance. So um, this is actually one motivation for us to uh, to explore Moco V3 with uh, uh, Vision Transformer as a backbone, uh, because Vision Transformer does not have, for example, translation uh, invariance as an inductive bias. So this is a joint work uh, both with the Kaiming and the signing. So if you guys don't know about Vision Transformer, uh, here is a, a, a rough architecture. Uh, so it will patchify the image uh, so into different patches, uh, make it a sequence, and then just treat each patch as a token feed into a, a transformer. Um, 
and then um, the location information is embedded into a position embedding, uh, uh, similar to transformer design. And then this transformer has a classification uh, token uh, that uh, classifies, uh, uh, that can be used to represent this entire image for classification. And the overall architecture uh, has less inductive bias because uh, first it removes the translation invariance. There's no weight sharing between different locations. And second one is it's actually a flat architecture. So it's not like a pyramid architecture with lower and lower resolutions uh, as the network uh, builds up. And in their paper, they show it's very scalable. Uh, so with larger models uh, with uh, uh, bigger data, it will uh, outperform uh, ResNet uh, or convolutional network based uh, methods. And this is a very, being scalable is a very, very important uh, uh, signal for self supervised or unsupervised learning because with self supervised learning, the biggest advantage is that we have infinite amount of data. So that motivates us to explore uh, VIT with self-supervised learning. And before that, we build a baseline called MoCo V3. And compared to MoCo V2, it's, it's actually a very uh, incremental change. Um, we still keep the momentum encoder. We still keep the concept of contrastive learning, but we remove the momentum queue. Um, and we add the predictor, uh, the additional MLP, and other bio recipes. And it, actually, you can view MoCo V3 as bio without the negatives. Um, uh, we did some hyperparameter search, and uh, with the release, the code uh, for MoCo V3, we can actually outperform uh, bio uh, on, uh, on ResNet 50 based backbone. So it's a strong baseline. Uh, uh, for self supervised learning. Um, so here is our setup for uh, vision transformer backbone. Uh, we use a VITB 16. 16 means uh, the, the patch size is a 60 by 6. And for a 224 by 224 input, it has uh, 196 patches. And for pre-training, we use the Adam W optimizer. It's a typical thing for transformer architectures. Uh, and we still use a linear evaluation on the frozen class token features. And the most important message we want to deliver in this paper is uh, instability. So what we find is that with a large batch size uh, and potentially with a large learning rate, they are coupled. Uh, training is more difficult for vision transformers. Um, and you can see that in the KN curve, uh, there are dips, uh, sometimes very big dips, uh, that influence the, the training stability. Um, and it indicates that the training is somehow a uh, uh, failure, but in the end, it, it still reaches some uh, level of uh, uh, reasonable accuracy if you do not check the the, the uh, intermediate uh, KN curve. Um, this is problematic because uh, uh, it's hard for people to do explore, uh, exploration in research uh, to compare one setup with another setup because it could be that uh, one setup is uh, uh, letting the network to be more unstable um, and uh, not because it is uh, uh, actually hurting the performance. And we find existing solutions, for example, LAMP, that's uh, another large batch optimizer for trans transformer, does not uh, help. Um, and we find a small trick to improve instability in this work. Uh, it's a random patch projection. So, uh, what we do is we stop the gradient uh, uh, right after the patch projection layer. Um, and it essentially narrows down the solution space for the optimizer. Um, so um, maybe that's very important for finding a good solution. 
Uh, we find it generally helpful when training uh, other self-supervised frameworks as well uh, for Simclear, for Bio, etc. But we have to note this is not a fundamental solution uh, because during the code release, we actually want to reproduce the result in GPU side and we find this solution is very sensitive to different initializations of the weights, uh, especially the initialization of a random patch projection layer. Um, yeah. And for uh, we studied different CMS network based frameworks like Simclear, Bio, etc. And we find these frameworks usually uh, work out of the box, but they behave differently. Uh, so contrastive learning seems to have an advantage uh, on VIT based uh, transformers. Yeah, this is showing the same thing. Um, and finally, to push for the state of the art, we added batch norm to the to the backbone, uh, and we have a, a huge model with a, 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 a huge input, uh, and we can reach the state of the art back then. Uh, but we find the instability issue is still uh, there if we apply the batch norm to uh, self-attention blocks. Uh, it's just a little caveat. And finally, we want to note that for end-to-end -end fine tuning, Moco V3 pre-training is also helping. Uh, so it's not just about the linear evaluation. Uh, it's actually a good initialization even for end-to-end -end fine tuning. So we compared different methods. So this mask the patch predictor is from the original VIT paper. They pre-train on JFT, uh, the 300 million data set. Um, and we find, and, and for DEIT is training from scratch. And we find with MoCo initialization, it can have better uh, uh, results than training from scratch. And with larger backbones, we find it's outperforming a concurrent work. Dino also from Facebook. And here are our takeaways for this maybe very dense talk. Uh, the first one is grid features uh, work just as well as region features, uh, according to our study. Um, and the second one is we find a simple CMS network can, can learn without collapsing. Uh, stop gradient is important uh, there. And uh, the third one is that uh, VIT works with such frameworks, uh, but instability is a, a big issue we want to call out for awareness. So if your network is being trained, please uh, check the monitor of, uh, of uh, during training uh, in order to uh, see whether it's training uh, in a healthy way. So all our code is, uh, is released. Uh, um, thanks. I think I'm almost right, right on time. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, so thank you, Xinlei, for the great talk. So, um, so I think we have uh, one more minute left, and uh, so we can also uh, um, uh, so run out of the time for maybe five minutes. But then, so it depends on. Uh, so whether we have questions. So, so any question from the audience? If uh, so, so if any. <clears throat> yeah, Xinlei, I have a quick question. Yes. I'm from the speech domain, so I'm not very sure what's uh, that the true view in your proposals uh -huh. uh, stop grad. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that just something like a rotation translation? Yes, yes. So it's the same image, but we do random cropping. So one crop can crop the dog's face, the other crop the body, um, and we do color augmentation. Uh, so it can be slightly yellowish, it can be slightly bluish. Uh, it's just a, a recipe for augmenting the image to create different views. So that to me is a huge randomness in this kind of augmentation, right? Yes, yes, there is randomness in this, uh, uh, in this, yeah. Uh, and I think the recipe for augmentation has also been evolved uh, uh, through different works. 
for example, Moco uses a Moco V1 uses a, the original uh, recipe. Simclear introduces a blur kind of a, a augmentation. Uh, I think Bio uses another uh, different augmentation. Moco V3 uses that, uh, and with the different generations of uh, augmentations, the performance usually gets better. But actually, augmentation is a, a shared common theme for all these networks as well, and we want to get rid of that. Uh, it's a uh, it's not too ideal uh, because it may change the distribution uh, from the original image. OK, thanks, Xinlei. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Hi, Xinlei. May I ask yes. you a question? Why mm -hmm. in the VIT mm -hmm. it's not stable? Mm -hmm. uh, you mean why it's not stable? Right. Um, I think that's a tricky question, uh, but for us, we believe the 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 issue is in uh, let's let me find the slide. Yeah, the issue is lies in optimizer. Uh, so we may want to develop better optimizers or search for different uh, high parameters in the current optimizer uh, to 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 do this uh, because. The random patch projection by itself is narrowing down the solution space for the optimizer. So with this narrow, narrowed solution space, it seems to find a good solution. But uh, when the solution space is big, uh, we allow the training of random patch projection, it seems to, uh, to get more unstable. So I guess if we if we want to point out a direction to work on for instability, then uh, uh, optimizer is a is a good one. But how? But the difference between the CNN and uh, uh, VIT, there is a one thing is uh, in the C CNN in your uh, SimSAM, basically you do the average pooling at the end, right? Mm -hmm. And here, you even though you have the CS token, but CS token use uh, the attention to aggregate different yes. patches together. Yes. So, have you tried use the uniform aggregation in the VIT and see if this stable things becomes better? So, to make sure the spatial attention is not the fact of the instability. Yes, we have tried that. Uh, okay. We have tried uh, many many things uh, for this, okay. uh, and. Uh, yeah, so average pooling of uh, uh, all the tokens instead of uh, using the class token is one thing we tried. Uh, it also works, uh, but it also suffers from the same instability issue. I see. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I have a related question. So on your uh, slides uh, before this one, you are showing uh, the instability is particularly severe for large batch size, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and why is this? It, it, is it related to the contrastive learning objective? Mm, I don't think it is uh, related to the contrastive objective. Uh, in fact, when we posted this paper, uh, and also the original author from VIT also uh, echo, echoed this phenomenon in their supervised uh, pre-training. Uh, so, and I, th I think later, I mean, right now we are also exploring different uh, VIT based uh, approaches and we also see the same thing. So objective function is a less of an issue. But note here, uh, when we increase the batch size, uh, we also linearly scale the learning rate. So that's why I'm saying large batch size and a large learning rate, uh, the training is, uh, is, is more unstable. Um, but this behavior is very different from uh, a ResNet based uh, 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 architecture because when the large learning rate is applied, the, the ResNet will, will just fail. Uh, so it will not recover from, uh, from the pre the, this partial failure results. Uh, so that's, uh, that's a difference and that's causing problems for 
uh, research explorations. I see. Yeah. So you are suggesting if we increase batch size while we reduce the learn rate, then the performance should be higher than the plot you are showing here. Uh, well, I think the, in order to maintain the performance, even for supervised image net pre-training, uh, one has to increase the learning rate. Uh, so if we have a large batch size, but we have a smaller learning rate, usually the performance is not as good. Uh, so because with large batches, it's uh, it has a less variance in terms of the data. So to the extreme, if the, the batch size is the entire data set, like 1 million, then it's it becomes a gradient descent. So gradient descent is uh, not as effective as a stochastic gradient descent uh, because it stochastic SGD introduces uh, um, variance uh, to let the model jump out of a uh, uh, local minimum, uh, for example. Uh, okay. Yeah, so it, it, it will not work. Uh, so fundamentally, I, yeah. I observed something similar for the click training. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm particularly interested in the, in the reasons why this happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you're, 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 you're saying, um, so this all happens for supervised learning, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. in the supervised learning setting, if we increase the batch size, mm -hmm. Will we see a similar performance drop? Is it such a large gap? Um, I, well, I haven't personally tried uh, supervised pre-training, um, but I think the, the this instability issue is real, uh, and it is more severe with a larger learning rate. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I can I can tell. Thank you. Yeah, we may discuss this offline. Yeah, yeah, we can discuss it, it offline. Sorry, I'm running in a rush with the technical issues in the beginning and and this. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me uh, uh, if you guys have uh, more questions. Yeah, thank you, Xinli. Uh, <clears throat> so for the uh, <clears throat> so for the great presentation, also the very solid work. And then, uh, so I think this is also a very nice ending to our talk series. And then let's uh, so thank our speaker again. And I think that's the end of the talk. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Xinlei. Thank, thank, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.